Hello everyone. So today we are going to be getting into a variety of things looking at 20th century psychology, thought, and religion in Europe. Let's get into it. So first we will start with psychology. And the big guy here is Carl Jung. Um, Carl Jung was a disciple of Freud. And at one point though, he had some issues with Freud. He felt that his theories were a little bit too narrow and felt that he needed to expand upon them. And really one of his big areas of expertise and studying is dreams because that leads to his ideas of the unconscious. Um, that Jung's idea is that the unconscious is twofold. There is a personal unconscious that is really just about you and your kind of hopes and dreams, but there's also the collective unconscious. And this is probably the, the bigger one that gets a lot more play here, is that the collective unconscious is a repository of memories that all human beings have, and it consists of, of various archetypes, mental forms, and images that often appear in dreams. I'm not going to get into all the archetypes. You can really look at those. Um, that, but the, these are common to all people, and they have a sp type of special energy, if you will, that helps to create myths, religions, and philosophies in which we live by. Um, and it kind of proves that you know you as an individual are only like there's you're part individual and part impacted by this collective unconscious. Um, the origin of this is so old that we don't know, but the function of it is to bring the original mind into a new, higher state of consciousness. And you see that quote there on the right, and you can kind of take a look at it. But the idea here, this is really, really influential, and the idea of kind of the function of human society, of how we're all put together, why we're doing what we're doing, and and Carl Jung's work ha has been, uh, you know, has been shared and expanded upon, but was was really revolutionary, revolutionary and important at the time. All right, let's get into some philosophy. And, and really one of the big moves here is the uh, development of existentialism. And this is something that kind of morphs out of uh, Friedrich Nietzsche's work, uh, who particularly proclaimed that God is dead. Uh, there's a big focus here. The main guys behind it on the left, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre and Albert Camus. And really a lot of it focuses on God. Okay, uh, and the absence of God in the universe. And when we expand upon that, is that the idea here is that the death of, of God is pretty tragic, but humans, as a result, humans have no preordained destiny, uh, but we are alone in the universe with no future and no hope, kind of, as you can see in the Calvin and Hobbes cartoon. Albert Camus has a quote here, and he says, a world that can be explained even with bad reasons is a familiar world. But on the other hand, in a universe suddenly divested of illusions and lights, man feels alien, a stranger. His exile is without remedy since he is deprived of the memory of a lost home or the hopes of a promised land. This divorce between man and life, the actor and his setting, is properly the feeling of absurdity. And if you stop there, kind of the idea, well, it's blank, we're all going to die, there's nothing here, we've got nothing, we've done nothing, we're purposelessness, but no. People are unique in this absurd world. And humans are the beings who first existed and thus can define themselves. Sartre said, man is nothing else but what he makes of himself. This is a huge concept here. The idea is that people must take full responsibility for what they are and who they are. And this can only be achieved through the involvement in your own life. And really the key thing here is being true to oneself and refuse to be depersonalized by society. And you kind of see two sides of a coin here. It's this idea, you know, almost atheistic that there is no God and, and there's no purpose and we're not driven by God. But then on the other hand, it's this idea of that you can define yourself that nothing is ordained, and your life can be as good or bad as you want it. And thus, that's why I think it became very, very popular. Uh, we also have some postmodern thought and philosophy going on here. And the idea of postmodern thought is it rejects the modern Western belief in objective truth, and it really focuses on the, um, the nature and the relative nature of reality, kind of like an Einsteinian look at things. Um, one of the big guys that influenced here was a, a Swiss man by the name of Ferdinand de Saussure, um, and he really looked at language and how meaning and knowledge operate through language, all right? And that language is a human construct, and that humans possess no capacity for knowledge until we had language. 
and it employs signs to denote meaning and it has kind of two concepts, the signifier and the signified. Okay, a signifier is the expression of some type of concept and the signified is the meaning of that concept that is expressed through language. Now, another guy that got really Im impressed by this language was Jacques Derrida, who really looked at, at Western culture and the, this focus on binary oppositions. I have to be this way or have to be that way. And he looked at language as kind of by examining language and the way that we say things as, as a really good expression of that. And he, he looked at language as something that also created culture and that indeed culture is something that is created. It's not inherent and that there are no fixed truths or universal meanings because language is so su so subjective. And again, this is an interesting look at things. It, it looks at, the, again, the, the relativity of things, that we look at something in one way, and we perceive it in one way, and we will express through language of it in one way, but someone else might have that opposite feel of it, which is, again, an interesting view. And, uh, and really another big guy here is uh, Michel Foucault, uh, who really gets down to power. That, that's the thing he looks at. He looks at the relationship of, of power. And his great quote here is, power is exercised rather than possessed. I'm going to let you think about that. And the whole idea of what he talks about is the diffusion of power and oppression marks all relationships. And we have some examples. Like, for instance, any act of teaching requires assertion on one end and submission on another. And whoever is asserting themselves in that, um, in that situation is exercising the power. And the same thing with laws and con of conduct. You know, so if we have a law, that establishes what is ideal behavior for those who conform. However, at the same sense, it then creates a subclass of people that don't conform, and thus you're outcasts because you are thus trying to resist power, which goes into the last point that power needs that resistance because it can't exist without it. And it's a really interesting look at power. It's not, you're, you know, you don't have power just because you're a police officer. You don't have power just because you were, you were born as a king or something like that, or you were elected as an official. It is how you exercise that power. And then as well, the resistance or the acceptance of that power. And it's a really interesting paradigm to look at. And it's something that's been been analyzed in a variety of ways and, and does influence things like, you know, government and stuff like that. And it's been, you know, his, his works have been really widespread. And it's a great thing, I think, to read, to really look at relationships and how they function. All right, finally, we're going to get into some religious revival at this time as well. Um, so post-World War II, we got a lot of religious things going on. And, and one guy that's really in the front is Protestant theologian Karl Barth. Um, he is going to use traditional Christian teachings, but try to understand them in the function of the modern world. And really what he gets into is the idea is that humans are sinful and imperfect. But you know what? That's okay. Because in being sinful and imperfect, it allows you to understand religious truths. And more importantly, receive the grace and forgiveness of God. And especially in the 1950s and 60s, you're going to see this big uptick in religion. You're going to see... Um, a larger spread of religion, not only in Western Europe, but across the world. And guys like Barth are on the forefront of that. Another big one, and we've talked about, you know, the Catholic Church the entire year. So let's get to it again. Uh, Pope John the Twenty Third, And I have here bringing the Catholic Church back. He was really focused when he became the Pope in 1958. And he was only Pope for five years, but in five years, he was tremendously impactful is he was really looking for a revival of the church. And what he's going to do is he is going to uh, create the 21st Ecumenical Council, or what becomes known as Vatican II. And the idea is we are looking at the church, we are looking how the church has progressed, and how can it function in this modern world. And so what are some things that are going to come out of it? Uh, number one, the mass is now to be done in vernacular languages. Huge. No more Latin everywhere. We need to focus on the language of the people. Uh, opening up dialogue with other religious groups, Jews, Muslims, Hindus, and trying to gain a greater understanding of them and a dialogue to promote 
I don't want to say equality, but to reduce conflict. Let's go with that. Um, refocusing on missionary work. Also doing things like reviving or res revising some prayers and uh, making liturgical music a bit more modern. And just overall trying to address the concerns of a new modern world. And we will see an expansion of Catholicism. And, and we've talked about the role of Catholicism, particularly in Poland, in, say, fighting, um, in fighting communism. And, you know, the Catholic Church, despite a lot of the, you know, I'm, I'm doing this in 2020, despite a lot of the controversies and stuff like that that have happened in the last few years, still a major player in the world, still very influential. And John the Twenty Third was somebody that really tried to thrust everything back, you know, from... I guess some of the, the fall going all the way back to the Reformation. All right, guys, so hopefully that uh, gave you a good bit of information here. We'll talk about it soon, and thanks for stopping by.